The United States tried to rectify all that by appointing territorial officers from New England and other anti-Mormon localities, but Brigham prepared to make their entrance into his dominions difficult. 3,000 United States troops had to go across the plains and put these gentlemen in office, and after they were in office, they were so helpless, they were as helpless as so many stone images. They made laws which nobody minded and which could not be executed. The federal judges opened court in a land filled with crime and violence and sat as holiday spectacles for insolent crowds to gape at. For there was nothing to try, nothing to do, nothing on the dockets. And if a genteel brought a suit, the Mormon jury would do just as it pleased about bringing in a verdict. And when the judgment of the court was rendered, no Mormon cared for it and no officer could execute it. Our president shipped one cargo of officials after another to Utah, but the result was always the same. <clears throat> they sat in a blight for a while. They fairly feasted on scowls and insults day by day. They saw every attempt to do their official duties find its reward in darker and darker looks, and in secret threats and warnings of a more and more dismal nature. And at last they either succumbed and became despised tools and toys of the Mormons, or got scared and discomforted beyond all endurance and left the territory. If a brave officer kept on courageously till his pluck was proven, some pliant Buchanan or Pierce would remove him and appoint a stick in his place. In 1857, General Harney came very near being appointed governor of Utah, and so it came very near being Harney governor and Cradlebaugh judge, two men who never had any idea of fear further than the sort of murky comprehension of it which they were enabled to gather from the dictionary. Simply, if for nothing else, for the variety they would have made in a rather monotonous history of federal civility and helplessness, it is a pity they were not fated to hold office together in Utah. Up to the date of our visit to Utah, such had been the territorial record. The territorial government established there had been a hopeless failure, and Brigham Young was the only real power in the land. He was an absolute monarch, a monarch who defied our president, a monarch who laughed at our armies when they encamped about his capital, a monarch who received without emotion the news that the august Congress of the United States and enacted a solemn law against polygamy, and then went forth calmly and married 25 or 30 more wives. B. The Mountain Meadows Massacre The persecutions which the Mormons suffered so long, and which they consider they still suffer, is not being allowed to govern, and not being allowed to govern themselves. They have endeavored and are still endeavoring to repay. The now almost forgotten Mountain Meadows Massacre was their work. It was very famous in its day. The whole United States rang with its horrors. A few items will refresh the reader's memory. A great immigrant train from Missouri to Arkansas passed through Salt Lake City, and a few disaffected Mormons joined in for the sake of the strong protection it afforded for their escape. In that matter lay sufficient cause for hot retaliation by the Mormon chiefs. Besides, these 145 or 150 unsuspecting immigrants, being in part from Arkansas, where a noted Mormon missionary had lately been killed, and in part from Missouri, a state remembered with execrations as a bitter persecutor of the saints when they were few and poor and friendless. Here were substantial additional grounds for lack of love for these wayfarers. And finally, the train was rich, very rich in cattle, horses, mules, and other property. And how could the Mormons consistently keep up their coveted resemblance to the Israeli-ish tribes and not seize the spoil of an enemy when the Lord had so manifestly delivered it into their hand. Wherefore, according to Miss C. V. Mrs. C. V. Waite's entertaining book, The Mormon Prophet, it transpired that, 
Quote, a revelation from Brigham Young is great grand Archie of God, or God, was dispatched to President J.C. Haight, Bishop Higby, and J.D. Lee, adopted son of Brigham, communicating them to rise all the forces they could muster and trust, follow those cursed Gentiles, so read the revelation, attack them disguised as Indians, and with the arrows of the Almighty make a clean sweep of them, and leave none to tell the tale. And if they needed any assistance, they were commanded to hire the Indians as their allies, promising them a share of the booty. They were to be neither slothful nor negligent in their duty, and to be punctual in sending the teams back to him before winter set in, for this was the mandate of Almighty God. The command of the revelation was faithfully obeyed. A large party of Mormons, painted and tricked out as Indians, overtook the train of immigrant wagons some 300 miles south of Salt Lake City and made an attack. But the immigrants threw up earthworks, made fortresses of their wagons, and defended themselves gallantly and successfully for five days. Your Missouri or Arkansas gentleman is not much afraid of the sort of scurvy apologies for Indians which the southern part of, southern part of Utah affords. He would stand up and fight 500 of them. At the end of the five days, the Mormons tried military strategy. They retired to the upper end of the meadows, resumed civilized apparel, washed off their paint, and then heavily armed, drove down in wagons to, be, to the beleaguered immigrants, bearing a flag of truce. When the immigrants saw white men coming, they threw down their guns and welcomed them with cheer after cheer, and all unconscious of the poetry of it, no doubt they lifted a little child aloft, dressed in white, in answer to the flag of truce. The leaders of the timely white deliverers were President Haight and Bishop John D. Lee of the Mormon Church. Mr. Cradlebaugh, who served a term as a federal judge in Utah and afterward was sent to Congress from Nevada, tells in a speech delivered in Congress how these leaders next proceeded. They professed to be on good terms with the Indians and represented them as being very mad. They also proposed to intercede and settle the matter with the Indians. After several hours, Parley, they, having apparently visited the Indians, gave the ultimatum of the savages, which was that the immigrants should march out of their camp, leaving everything behind them, even their guns. It was promised by the Mormon bishops that they would bring a force and guard the immigrants back to the settlements. The terms were agreed to, the immigrants being desirous of saving the lives of their families. The Mormons retired. It subsequently appeared with 30 or 40 armed men. The immigrants were marched out, the women and children in front and the men behind, the Mormon guard being in the rear. When they had marched in this way about a mile at a given signal, the slaughter commenced. The men were almost all shot down in the first fire from the ground. Two only escaped who fled to the desert and were followed 150 miles before they were overtaken and slaughtered. The women and children ran on two or three hundred yards further when they were overtaken and with the aid of the Indians they were slaughtered. Seventeen individuals only of all the immigrant party were spared, and they were little children, the eldest of them being only seven years old. Thus, on the 10th day of September, 1857, was consummated one of the most cruel, cowardly, and bloody murders known in our history. Unquote. The number of persons butchered by the Mormons on this occasion was 120. With unheard of temerity, John Cradlebaugh opened his court and proceeded to make Mormondom answer for the massacre. And what a spectacle it must have been to see this grim veteran, solitary and alone in his pride and his pluck, glowering down on his Mormon jury and, and Mormon auditory, deriding them by turns and by turns, breathing threatenings and slaughter. An editorial in the Territorial Enterprise of that day says of him and of the occasion, he spoke and acted with the fearlessness and resolution of a Jackson, 
but the jury failed to indict or even report on the charges, while threats of violence were heard in every quarter, an attack on the U.S. troops intimated if he persisted in his course. Finding that nothing could be done with the juries, they were discharged with a scathing rebuff from the judge, and then sitting as a committing magistrate, he commenced his task alone. He examined witnesses, made arrests in every quarter, and created a consternation in the camps of the saints, greater than any they had ever witnessed before, since Mormondom was born. At last accounts, terrified elders and bishops were decamping to save their necks, and developments of the most startling character were being made, implicating the highest church dignitaries in the many murders and robberies committed upon the Gentiles during the past eight years. Had Harney been governor, Cradlebaugh would have been supported 